The number one battle every human on the planet is up against right now is chronic inflammation. If you have inflammation, your endocrine system's already off. Your hormones and your neurotransmitters are having difficulty communicating in order for your body to function as designed. The problem with coffee is tastes so damn good. <laughs> it smells fantastic. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> and it really helps when you feel really tired in the morning. Urine is super alkaline and it nourishes the microbiome and it helps produce nitric oxide. And the longer it ages, the more alkaline it becomes. So swishing urine, snorting urine, using an eye cup, putting urine in your eyes recovers the microbiomes. A lot of people have issues with stress and with feeling stressed. What would be your best tips or techniques for stress relief? How do you like NFTs? I'm well, I don't so know curious. enough about them, but I'm but I have a membership community and what I'm noticing is I'm I'm 49. I've been in the yoga and in holistic ayurvedic wellness space for 20 years and it's, you know, because of I know what I know, right? And so understanding that like the how fast the market's changing, how fast crypto's changing, what uh, connection and community and how how we can be more direct to directly connected to the person who wants to buy something with less less people in the middle less stuff in the middle to me is super fascinating like i'm i'm just curious as someone who has community memberships that's more or less what i sell is like and we've yeah. committed members so i'm like i don't understand and I, and i can see how like i could make avatars into superheroes like i can see kind of like where mm -hmm. this you know where virtual reality and the millennial market is going and how if i don't pay attention to that uh i'll end up really just selling to my age group as i age as opposed to being relevant to intergenerational spaces oh yeah well i th i think this is in in this case it's not so much about using a certain technology which is nfts it's more about uh, like your marketing it's more about like how you present yourself how you um who who you whom you're basically talking to through which channels um for example tiktok is like where a lot of the younger crowds are where you could potentially reach them but i but the the older uh, um People are also catching up on TikTok. I think it's very relevant. Um, it's it's really whom you're talking to, and and F NFTs at the moment are a hype because there's there's been some projects that really got uh, took off, and you know um, they became really popular, and that's why everyone's looking at NFTs. But I I don't think they'll play a major role in the economy in a sense that they will change the way we do online memberships because mm -hmm. there's some there's some stuff that isn't solved uh, um, with nfts for example sales tax you know if you if you sell a course or a membership then usually in the us you would pay sales tax depending on the state or the county um in in europe you would pay vat but yeah. nfts have this this uh, property that uh, people who bought the nft can sell it to someone else but then they would also usually you know they they don't have a system for charging sales tax and, and whatnot so i think i think it's it's more it's it's more like interesting for art projects and uh things that that people would speculate about their their, their future value on versus yeah. like being like mass adopted to you know because mass adoption is still far away because you know you would need a metamask so you would need kind of like your wallet and who can who can do that i mean who can it's most people can't so it's 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 very very small minority of people who can even deal with that and so mm -hmm. i think it's it's still far away but it really makes sense yeah. to look at these look at the these technologies and be aware of it and um, yeah. I think that that actually makes sense. But unless you can produce something, some kind of, in my opinion, some kind of piece of art that people would kind of trade, 
among themselves speculating the value is going to go up in the future yeah yeah I don't think that it will be so relevant even though like a lot of my nft friends tend to believe that way <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> nft is the future everything's gonna be an nft I don't know you know like I'm a I'm a skeptical but I'm open so I'm exploring each and every thing that's going on and I I, I appreciate you do the same it's it's really It's very important if you sell information online. Yeah. But it's yeah. mostly branding, in my opinion. What, what you have to get right to, you know, still be able to speak to the younger crowd. But mm. maybe, it, is that your wish? Like, would you, would you like to speak to a younger group of people? I would, I would like to be intergenerationally relevant. And so now, and we're in a big sort of branding of... <laughs> Branding slash layering overhaul where we've been, I, I started yogahealer.com in 2001 and yoga's changed. And what, you know, as a, what was I in, in then 49 minus 21. So I was 28. So things have changed a lot uh, in the world. And then yeah. at the time I, uh, I was developing curriculums around habits and that's really what evolved in the last 20 years is that is like we are a habit coaching company and we're countering chronic inflammation mm -hmm. like the number one the number one battle every human on the planet is up against right now is chronic inflammation and so we're so off brand with yoga that we have to pivot we have to either like I mean, we can keep it because it's fine for what it does but it really gets in the way and then we have a wellness pro development program that's a it's a really great business model for wellness pros, and that's called yoga health coaching. But we have mental health therapists, personal trainers, doctors, nurses, like we, and like the branding just gets in the way. It, like it's actually like a barrier to entry. Oh yeah. So we're in, we're yeah. changing. Yeah, if you talk about yoga, then you're almost like, you're very specific already. Like, you know, like a lot of people wouldn't associate fighting inflammation with yoga. No, like you, well, you, and we I, don't I stream yoga. online yoga classes, so we don't even have what they no. think we have. So we're we're so off, Sven, <laughs> and it's I've put this problem off for seven years, and continued to. I have a child, I have this business, I have this team, and like it's been doing its thing, and now I'm just like, okay, we can't put it off a day longer. So we're looking for new names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you know, I I think anything. Anything, I think inflammation is really a, a thing to, um, I, I would go like for a, like some kind of anti-inflammatory brand if I was you. Mm. So I have Be a brand, Body Thrive, that was based on, mm. that's based on this book that I wrote years ago. And mm -hmm. so I have bodythrive.com and I'm like, that kind of works that's with anti-inflammation. Awesome. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Um, speaking of which, um, how, how, how does yoga help against inflammation? Well, that's just it. So what happened 20 some years ago is I was in an advanced yoga teacher training program in San Francisco. It's like a two-year school. And I was in a two-year school for Ayurvedic medicine to become a practitioner. And I was going back and forth with these two communities. And they're both rooted in the Vedic tradition. Like They come from the same... They come from the same Uh, essential sciences. And I realized that they had very little crossover. Like the, the, mm. like the yoga people didn't know anything about Ayurveda and the Ayurveda people really didn't have a yoga practice. And that was so kind of asinine, I think is a, is a good word for it. Because when something gets so specific, but you lose the root, you lose the foundation, you lose a lot. And so mm. I was coming in with the most basic foundation of like, this is what you both need to know about each other. And I called it daily routines of a yogi. And it's based on something that it's kind of like, you know, in med school, how they say like the typical doctor gets like, you know, three hours to three days of training in nutrition. Like it's, it's kind of a joke yeah. in holistic community. It's like, well, in Ayurveda school, with two year program, you might get like a day on what's called Dinacharya, which means the circadian rhythm habits. The habits all mm -hmm. humans need. So, Dinacharya. And in yoga school, we maybe put an hour in, in a two-year program on that daily routine. And I took that and I, 
I brought it into a one year, it's now a one year program. It takes us a year, a whole year with a typical, fairly, fairly healthy modern human to have them get most of the habits most of the time to be in circadian rhythm, which is what the human body needs to thrive. Okay, so the circadian rhythm is like the day-night rhythm. Anything else? Yeah, that's it. So, But it, it runs our entire endocrine system. So if we don't want to have dementia when we're older, if we don't want to have issues with, uh, I mean, basic things like hunger and satiation, and that's off for so many people right now. Most people have chronic inflammation right now, statistically speaking. So if you have inflammation, your endocrine system's already off. You're having your hormones... And your neurotransmitters are having difficulty communicating in order for your body to function as designed. And mm -hmm. a lot of this is due to, you know, most people are eating the majority of their calories later in the day. A lot of people are eating the majority of their calories. If you include alcohol um, after the sun goes down or towards the night. And so then we're staying up later because it feels horrible to go to bed on a full stomach. And then mm -hmm. we're waking up later And, these, you know, it just sets off a cortisol response when people have low-grade chronic stress or, in this case, negative stressors or distress, and that generates more low-grade inflammation. And there's a spiraling effect uh, that happens over time. Ah, so you, you attribute that mainly to, like, uh, the long s sleep pattern, the wrong s sleep, uh, sleep pattern, like going Yeah, so it goes into, stuff. so it's sleeping, it's eating, it's moving, and it, it's all those things. And so like a few thousand years ago, the yogis were like, oh, if you're going to do yoga, like if, you, if you're after enlightenment, because 2,000 years ago, yoga was equated with enlightenment, not with, not with mm -hmm. like having a yoga butt, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, right, so it's like, how is the human technology designed and how can I awaken to the full use of my technology. And, mm -hmm. and with that, it was like, well, the first thing you need to do is like get set, get set in your rhythms so that you build the container to hold more energy in your nervous system. That's sort of how it went. So in order to do that, you would just follow the daily rhythm, the Dina, Dina's daily, Charya's, the, this rhythm, this, this wheel that turns day in and day out. So going to bed early, waking up early, intermittent fasting, uh, moving on an empty stomach to open your breath body. All these were just basic, basic habits, like basic, like, oh, if you're going to do that, if you want to strengthen your nerves to hold more capacity, to hold more light, then line yourself up to the rhythm. Okay. So, so you would say, um, so tra traveling a lot overseas is uh, not good, right? Because of, you know, well, the jet lag and whatnot. Well, there's, okay. So then it's like, How do we adapt for modern life? So say when you get to where you're going, you get in rhythm with the place that you're in, that'll help. Do you do a ton of mm -hmm. travel? Yeah. So how long are you normally in a place? Um, I would say usually one or two weeks. -ish. And do you adjust to the time zone or do you sort of stay in this, in a, It'd be such a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I adjust to it. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not that big of a partier. You know, I don't like to go out at night too much, like a little bit here and there. Yes, but usually I, I don't. And I, uh, but what I do is to get into that new rhythm, I use melatonin. Yeah. Tell me more about that. So uh, in the US, you can buy it everywhere, like CVS or Walgreens. You, there is like sizes between one and uh, 10 milligrams. Usually I, I would eat like one or two milligrams is sufficient to me. And then uh, if it's nighttime, then I'll just <laughs> take, take some melatonin. Yeah. I'm quite sensitive to it. And then I'll, I'll just sleep and I don't yeah. care. And I also do that like when, I, when I'm in the plane, I'll also put myself to sleep Yeah, because it's so yeah, uncomfortable. I mean, and And that, I think, is like one of the coolest things about now is that we can get, you know, you can buy, buy neurotransmitters in bottles and take them, like, right? So you can adjust your, your physiology. Yeah. So other things that'll help is like when you wake up in the morning in the new place is like go, is just go outside early. Just go walk. And when you walk, yeah. you release some of that 
ether energy from flying and it helps ground your nervous system. If you can be barefoot, um, if it's like seasonally uh, appropriate, like that also really helps like connecting the bottoms of our feet Mm -hmm. um, to natural ground dispels a lot of the, the nervous system energy. Um, and gets you deeper into rhythm. Allowing your eyes to take in natural light at dawn and dusk will also start mm-hmm. to re-regulate your own, you know, your your pineal gland and melatonin internally, serotonin internally, and all that. All that absolutely helps. What we find with, uh, you know, like just the the life of a lot of people right now, just due to devices and whatnot, um, and and we see it in teens, we see it in kids. It's like having a hard time going to sleep naturally, having a hard time getting yeah. enough sleep and being in a state that goes towards adrenaline addiction. Uh, and then that has, you know, a lot of, mm. a lot of the issues right now that we, we just keep seeing as, uh, as, as wellness professionals. And I coach this big group of wellness professionals and it's, it's at the, me- mo- you know, the Western medical system, the allopathic medical model is set up to deal with acute inflammation. And what most people have right now is this slow grade chronic inflammation that builds and builds and builds. The the more we're, you know, using screens at night, the more we're eating processed food, the more frequently we're eating and not allowing the rest and digest function that also really helps to regulate the the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So intermittent fasting is now a hit buzzword, thank goodness, um, as people are realizing that their digestive tract needs to rest. And reset. That's very cool. I, I think. How do I know if I have chronic inflammation or not? I mean, I sleep well, but. Well, yeah. I mean, if you have how you feel when you wake up is probably the biggest telltale sign. So I feel if terrible. when people, <laughs> do, you, do you? Yeah, I'm. I'm so tired. I'm like, okay, it's it's terrible. Like I, I need okay. like uh, maybe forty five minutes to even come to senses. I'm like okay. a zombie in the morning. So when you get out of bed, are your joints stiff? A bit, yes. Okay. Do you feel groggy or heavy? Yeah. Okay. So then, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's how. <laughs> okay. that's, that's what chronic inflammation. Like that's the easiest way to tell is how you feel when you wake mm-hmm. up. And so when mm. you know, if you look at your calendar, just schedule a couple of weeks to totally unplug and reset and and get a new baseline of like, okay, mm. this is what it feels like when I'm super rested, connected with nature, going to bed early, waking up early. Just take care of your body for like two weeks, because like a week it can take you a week to get into it, depending on mm-hmm. how plugged in you are i mean and i I speak from experience with this right it's hard to unplug and unwind and let the mind unravel a bit i i was just recovering from let's say a flu and so (laughs) i i did exactly that so i was just like you know sleeping and doing nothing so yeah so i'm kind i already started the process Sweet. So that's also a good um, thing to talk about. It's like our body will naturally reset us to, right? Like we'll become more susceptible to stuff and we'll get sick and it'll shut down and then we'll process inflammation, a lot of it, because we'll usually lose our appetite. Some people even lose sense of taste, sense of smell, right? And that really shuts down, like if you don't smell and taste, food becomes way less sexy. So then we rest our digestion. Yeah. The thing is, this time, I I had such a good appetite, you know? I was kind um, of destroyed in bed and had limb pain and whatnot, but my appetite was fantastic. <laughs> 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 and, <laughs> and I enjoyed food. I was like, well, <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> so my, my, my smelling and, uh, you know, tasting was fantastic. And I wasn't used to that. I was quite quite surprised. I was like, what kind of flu is that? But I guess I I do have that because I'm 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 also like I have a hard time with allergies. You know, we have pollen yeah. outside, and that's the so other I sign. So like the early signs of chronic are allergies, asthma, and ectopic dermatitis. Those are the three biggest ones, and we see them the most in in, in children as well as like the first signs that there's a, what's called an allostatic load. So allo means other stasis. So there's homeostasis and allostasis. 
right? So homeo is yeah. like your body's like, we're all good. We know who we are. And allostasis means like there's too much other mixed with human DNA. There's too much other stuff going on. There's too much. It just literally means other, like it can't find self. And so allostatic load is the measurement. So allopathic medicine, same thing. Allopathy is other disease. Mm -hmm. uh, allostatic is is the load. There's lo the load of allostasis um, is the load of, of inflammation. And they have a number of different markers to, to measure that. And it's basically measuring oxidative stress. So how much, how, how stressed out are your cells? And I mean, are you vedically speaking, if I speak more from the tradition that um, I was trained in, it means that there's just, a, there's a toxic load on the physiology that's disrupting the ability mm -hmm. for uh, cells to connect, for, for neurotransmitters to communicate. So now the system's dumbed down a bit. Over time, it the inflammation, if you will, will localize into an organ or into um, a gland and, and generate, mm. or a system and generate disease. So allergies are a sign that like, I'm not adapting to my environment. So if you look it up on Google, they'll say you're allergic. There's these allergens that are causing the allergies. But if you look into the scientific literature, it'll say that chronic inflammation is the underlying cause of having a response mm -hmm. to allergens. Okay, so um, so you were talking about the the habits, or let's say anti-inflammatory habits, um, like next to getting good sleep or having like good sleep patterns and not eating too late and not using devices at night. Um, what else would you recommend? Like, what should I do in order to get rid of those uh, inf this inflammation? Yeah. That's a good question. So tell me more about your allergies. Ah, well, yeah, my eyes get itchy and I used to have asthma uh, when I was a child. The asthma in your lungs, are, that's cleared up. That's done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have, <clears throat> I don't have asthma now. Okay. Okay. So it's more of just like in any itchy skin or is it mostly just eyes and mucus? Yeah. It, it feels like, yeah, it's a bit of mucus, it's itchy eyes, and it's like it, it might, a little bit of throat pain. And okay. it feels like I have a cold, but I don't. Yeah. Yeah, okay. like usually. And then my allergy tablets, you know, my antihistaminic uh, uh, stuff, that helps. So that, that's a clear, clear indicator to me that it's an allergy. Yeah. Okay. Great. So... One of the ways to the one of the ways I look at allostatic load now is like what microbiomes are affected. So if we look at mm. we have human DNA cells, right? We have the human genome, and then we have the the microbiome, and we have the virome. Mm -hmm. And the virome is sort of the they call it like the dark matter of of DNA. Like we don't uh, mm -hmm. we don't we don't have that mapped so well, but we know that the biome is dependent on the virome. And that diversity seems to be part of the name of the game. And we know that mm -hmm. the human microbiome is, it's like an endangered species, right? It's, it's like we're down like 30% from where we were as humans, as a species, like 100 years mm -hmm. ago. The more urban we are, the more the microbiome is losing diversity. So when we lose diversity, yeah. we develop dysbiosis. So a lot of people are like gut microbiome. It's like, yep, that's one. You got your gut microbiome. You got your colon microbiome. And there's different species that live in different areas. And then you've got your mouth microbiome mm. and your throat. Mm. And your so your orolome is the mouth microbiome. And then you have your sinus microbiome. And then you have mm. your lung microbiome. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, <laughs> your skin microbiome. Like, wait, the mm. whole thing's alive. Wow, you know? So dysbiosis means that there's detrimental or dangerous microbes, microbes that are not host friendly, you're the host, and mm -hmm, that yeah. eubiotic, and that eubiotic microbes are, uh, are losing the battle. And so the yeah. balance is off. It's like Star Wars, like the bad guys winning, Darth Vader's, his stormtroopers are winning, and the good guys, the Jedi Knights are, and the Jedi Knights, if you even think about it, I've never... <laughs> I've never drawn this analogy before, but I'm going to go with it, Sven. <laughs> uh, you know, like the Jedi Knights are kind of like a mixed, they're kind of like a hippie group. Like they, ha they have a lot of diversity. You've got like Chewbacca yeah. and, and then, but the stormtroopers all look alike. Yeah, they look alike. Yeah, totally. They look alike. 
And that's what happens yeah. in the body is you get, and it's kind of wild how dysbiosis works in the microbiome. Um, the dysbiosis, it creates a biofilm. Well, both the good guys and the bad guys create biofilms, and that's like the environment in which they live. But the dysbiotic biofilms are they're, they create organelles. They create ways of living that don't require oxygen. So they, they're mm. often anaerobic. Yeah. And they can seal out that layer between where, where oxygen's coming into the body or nutrients are coming into the body and that human DNA level of cell. So the endothelial or epithelial lining. Mm. And they cover that. So the dysbiotic biofilm will just cover that. And so in the yeah. lungs, it creates like a fibrosis and the, in the ostea, the little teensy tiny channels that go from the nasal passages into the sinuses, they can get totally blocked. So then airflow doesn't get into the sinuses. And then the sinuses, the job of the microbiome, the Jedi Knights in the sinuses, mm -hmm. their job is to create nitric oxide. And yeah. nitric oxide is the third gas, right? This vasodilator that, that kills pathogens, kind of handy to have. Yes, that that's why I that's why I tape my mouth at night so that I am forced to breathe through through the nose because I want that nitrous oxide to help. Because we want kill the nitric oxide. Yeah. So then the question can be is like how do we like get the, you know, just to continue my dorky analogy here, like how do we get how do we get the nutrients to the Jedi Knights? Like how do we how do we arm the Jedi Knights with what they need? And then how do we also get more Jedi Knights that are diverse? They're not stormtroopers. They're not all the same. So we might be missing certain bacteria uh, and certain viruses, good, good guy viruses that are, you know, basically uh, helping the host produce all the, produce its own histamines, for example. I, or I can tell you what I tried uh, for, for, for yeah. you know, helping with that. Um, I read yeah. like... If, so some some friend of mine, uh, Christian is his name, recommended that to me. So there is like a German doctor called Doctor Probst, Doctor Probst, and he he's a proponent of this inorganic sulfur sulfur therapy. Have you heard of that? It's no. he says okay, um, it's very interesting. It's you, you might like it. Uh, he he has a theory that he says okay, in order for your body to become whole again, uh, you need an anionic, uh, let's say, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, like like your, your, your system needs to be anionic, like negative your ions. Yeah, negative ions. And, yeah, love yeah, it. And, and you need uh, alkalinity. And yeah. like, and he says like some things that, that humans have practiced for thousands of years is to eat Anorganic sulfur um, mm. with a spoon, and hmm. you do that, and and that will that will make your body become like that. And he 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 claimed that he you know healed a lot of people with cancer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's very interesting, mm. and so it's it's called sulfur therapy. And so what I literally did, and it's 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 extreme. I mean. Uh, I I bought anorganic sulfur from the pharmacy, or I think it was from from uh, Amazon. It's it's very cheap. It's like five bucks or so, such a bucket. And then, and then what he says, what Doctor Probst says, is that your body is like being overloaded with anions, and uh, like your body, and you're supposed to eat a certain way so that you don't eat acidic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then yeah. your your whole microbiome will uh, shift, and it's it's also designed in a way that so supposedly all those bad bacteria that you were referring to, yeah. they die of that brutal sulfur thing and uh, sulfur. Anorganic sulfur. It's but it's it's really wild because if you fart, it stinks. Like so, so you oh, have to sulfur. be alone doing yeah. this. Yeah, sulfur. Yeah, it's it's extreme and and it's like and you'll have sometimes you know you you might poop in your pants or uh, because it's it's so extreme. Like what happens to your gut is like it's crazy. Yeah, but, it's clearing this stuff yeah. out. It's clearing yeah, out the yeah. dysbiotic biofilms and yeah, it, yeah, that's awesome. It's a crazy so, thing. It was the craziest thing I've ever done. Well, there's there's something that may even be crazier that works that everybody has already at home. 
no matter where they are. And that's, this is kind of wild. We need to Hi. talk about this. <laughs> we need to talk about, so urine. Yeah. So urine is super alkaline and it nourishes the microbiome and it helps produce nitric oxide. And the, the longer it ages, the more uh, alkaline it becomes and the more it eats oxidative stress. So there's a way of measuring, uh, what is it, the oxidative stress, the oxidative uh, negative oxidation potential. No, what am I saying? The ORP meter, oxidation reduction potential, is one of the ways you can measure how antioxidant um, a liquid is. And aged urine goes really low. So like water's at like zero and spring water's at like negative a few and fresh urine's at like, I think like negative 25 and like aged urine can go like negative 200. Whereas like things that are like bad water, if you're in a city and you're drinking the chlorinated water, it'll be like positive 30. ORP and mm -hmm. the oxidation reduction, but it's actually oxidizing your body. So swishing urine, snorting urine, using an eye cup, putting urine in your eyes recovers the microbiomes. Why in, in your eyes? Like what effect does it supposedly have? From, from what I can tell from experience, it's nourishing. It nourishes the cells. So in the ancient text, and it's, it's in the Ayurvedic texts uh, from about 2000 years ago, it's in the Pali Canon from the Buddha. The Buddha was like, you need, you need a few things. You need a root. You need a tree big enough with roots so you can sleep between the roots. You need some scraps for clothing. You need an alms bowl. And you need aged urine for your medicine. So it seems to work everywhere. Like rub it on your skin, shoot it up your anus, swish it in your mouth, snort it up your nose drop it in your ears, wash your eyes with it, and it has a nourishing effect. So they say it's rejuvenative in the ancient text, two factors, antitoxic. So it removes the toxicity of the, the biofilms, the dysbiotic biofilms. And then two, it's rejuvenative. And it's rare to have substances that do both. I'm super curious about the sulfur. It sounds like that does both too. Mm -hmm. uh, but most substances will do like more on one side than the other side where they'll like be super cleansing, not rejuvenating or super rejuvenating, not so cleansing or detoxifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The sulfur you shouldn't put into your eyes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be a bad idea, but <laughs> <laughs> that would be a bad idea. So back to like, you know, a lot of, a lot of times with chronic, with chronic, With chronic inflammation that goes to allergies, it's like why the question you want to ask yourself, I find, is like, why is my immune system reacting to the environment? Yeah. That's a very right? good question. And then why and if we look at the connection between the nervous system and the immune system, that can be helpful. Uh, if we look at the connection between the immune system and the digestive and elimination system, that can be helpful too. So like for me, when I was little and had allergies, I think it was largely due to uh, standard American diet. So too much processed food in my mm. diet. And it was linked to not having a strong enough evacuative function. So in Ayurvedic medicine, we'd say that it's a panavayu. The downward moving flow of energy wasn't strong enough. So I had constipation. So mm -hmm. there was like a, there was a backup on, now I've got dysbiotic microbiome in my colon because I'm not eliminating. There's not that downward flow. Mm -hmm. There's more allostatic load on the system. Enough becomes enough and now I'm reacting to the environment. So allergies can happen for so many reasons, but like one of the first things that we look at in Ayurveda is like, what's going on with digestion and elimination? Like number one, what's going mm -hmm. on there? Is it seamless? Is it perfect? Okay, now we'll move on to number two. But if it's not, we'll just start there. So a lot of See. people now are just not simply fasting for long enough, including children. So their digestive tract just always has stuff in it. So then you end up with boggy lymph because this stuff mm -hmm. gets, moves from the digestive tract into the blood, into the lymph. Like it just gets boggy. And then that will create allergies or asthma or ectopic dermatitis. Like it goes to all three. I see. Um Would you would you also say <clears throat> joint pain and um, obesity 
are those also infl infl inflammation related? We know everything. It's like it's like so hard to find things that are not inflammation related right now. So right mm -hmm. now, on the like according to the World Health Organization, three out of five people die of chronic inflammatory diseases. In the U.S., it's estimated that at least eighty percent of people have chronic inflammation. So it's high. I mean, in, right now in the U.S., like twenty-seven percent of kids are on are on medications, and most of those are for chronic inflammation. But part of the problem is we what we know from scientific literature is that chronic inflammation is diet and lifestyle driven. So it's really mm -hmm. hard to solve diet and lifestyle driven problems with pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And it's hard to get to the bottom of any of it if we're not getting enough sleep and if we're not resting our digestive tract long enough and if we're not doing the whole digestion absorption elimination cycle spot on. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you personally think of coffee? I love it. One of my members had a <laughs> had a t-shirt on yesterday <laughs> and it said inject coffee to start. And it was like, I love that. Um, I listened to an interview <laughs> last week with Deepak Chopra and with some science, some liver doctor scientists on the, you know, just on the effects of coffee in terms of, you know, the adaptogenic effects and the um, antioxidant effects and, and all that. What I think the problem for a lot of people with coffee or with stimulants in general uh, is that if they're in an adrenaline addiction pattern, That is, it's a chronic inflammation pattern. If we look at the brainwave states, they're in like a high beta brainwave state where there are, they're always kind of triggered. They're always like on and you get this wired and tired effect where they're not able to then drop into delta and theta brainwave states for long mm -hmm. enough to deeply reset their metabolism. I mean, one of the things, and maybe you can relate to this as an entrepreneur, but like if we don't do the right work, we can just keep generating more work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think yeah, that's how it works when we're in, for certain people that, like with coffee, where they're just in the wired and tired and they're just generating more and more of that high beta brainwave state busyness. There's never enough mm. time. There's always in a rush. They're always behind. There's always too much to do. They're never doing what they actually really want to do in the moment. Like that pattern, coffee doesn't seem to help that pattern <laughs> that much. Like they're... They're often driven by the coffee in that brainwave state. Yeah, the problem with coffee is tastes so damn good. <laughs> it smells fantastic. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> 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 And it really helps when you feel uh, really tired in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for, like, there's this old story in the... Uh, There's an old story that's told to Ayurvedic practitioners around exam time, and it's the story about there were 100 students and the guru, and the guru said, your final test is to go find a plant that's not a medicine. And the students go out mm. into the forest, and, uh, you know, they slowly trickle back with this plant or that plant or the other plant, and days go by, and everyone's back except for, like, one guy, and then one, the one guy finally shows up, and he's like, I can't find one. I can't find mm. a plant that's not a medicine. Oh, that brings me to a very interesting uh, topic. Have Have you heard of Paul Saladino, the carnivore MD? He no, he, uh, oh no, but his, I've heard, I know about the carnivore diet. Okay, I'll check him yeah. out. He his, you know, there's there's a lot of people on YouTube that say that okay, they all had all kinds of weird diseases, and the only yeah. thing that really helped them was the carnivore diet. Yeah. And uh, I was. That really made, quite made me curious, uh, and so I, I researched a little bit about that. And there is this guy Paul Saladino called the Carnivore MD. He um, he has this theory. He says basically what you just said. He says, okay, plants um, plants cannot, unlike animals, plants cannot walk away. So the, what they do uh, for like escaping their Uh, 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 their enemies is they produce defense chemicals and some of those defense chemicals uh, are medicines for example in this case with with coffee would be the caffeine it's a defense chemical etc etc and plants do alkaloids all that do all kinds of stuff with the human body so his his 
theory is, okay, um, because plants produce defense chemicals, it's bad to eat anything but the fruit, like chronically. He says, okay, in, whereas, for example, animals, you can eat... Uh, ninety nine percent of the animals that are walking around, like in a forest, for example, and you probably cannot eat ninety nine percent of the plants. Otherwise, you get sick or maybe even die. So he says, okay, uh, if you want to live healthy, then uh, just do the carnivore diet and eat fruits because plants want you to eat fruits. They uh, don't produce that that many defense chemicals inside, so um, you're gonna be a lot healthier and this is basically the lifestyle he um promotes and yeah he's feeling fine he's looking fantastic you can see that on instagram what's your thought about that well yeah i mean i i learned about it through michaela peterson jordan peterson's daughter was on it for her she had juvenile mm -hmm. uh rheumatoid arthritis i believe and yeah. i mean for for people with autoimmune i mean the thing is with and I'm just going to refer to what I know more about, which is Ayurvedic medicine. So in Ayurveda, they're mm -hmm. basically like imbalance starts in the digestive tract. Mm -hmm. So always start there. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with cancer or autoimmune disease or allergies or asthma. Like, let's look at it, digestion, absorption, elimination first. Now, if you're on the carnivore diet, like anyone who's ever tried to do a, a mono diet. So we, in Ayurveda, we'd say this is a mono diet. It's like, or simplify their diet. It's like the extreme elimination diet, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. You just took out so you just took out all of processed food. Yeah. Chances yeah. are if you're eating steak a lot, like you're not snacking between meals. You're not having like no. bacon between bites of snake steak, right? And if you're just doing cow no. or just doing right? So you've just taken out you're now in intermittent fasting. Right. I mean just and just those two things, like that's gonna that's gonna take away most people's problems right there. Absolutely. Are there other ways to do it for the vegans? I do believe so. Um, maybe not in all cases. Maybe not in all cases. Mm. I also really like to look at uh, what did your ancestors eat? Like what did your an yeah. like, especially the ancestors that had had longevity, your healthiest ancestors? Like what did they eat? Because when I started to put that together, that I mean, in Ayurveda, they teach that you have seven generations, and there's a lot of mysticism with numbers. So there's like, you, you don't take everything literally in Ayurveda. It's more you take numbers conceptually. And seven is a complex number, right? Like seven's got, it's got a four and a three, and it's, it's you can make lots of cool shapes with it, and, right? You've got, mm -hmm. you've got a level of complexity into history, and that's ancestral memory. So if we look at the genetic code, like the genetic code, if you're optimizing your physiology and you're paying attention to mate selection, like things should get better and better and better. Right. So if we yeah. look at that and like the intention of the ancestors, like our ancestral memory to activate that, it's like, what, what were they eating are is more to familiar to our physiology. So often in today's day and age, like people will learn something like, oh, I'm going to try this new, I'll be a vegan for these reasons, or I'll be a carnivore for these reasons, or I'll go yeah. paleo for these reasons. And then they just eat foods that are, you know, published in some book or some magazine, or they heard about on some podcast without asking the questions of like, what did my ancestors really digest well? But in Ayurvedic medicine, we do that. We pay attention to ancestral memory. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I found right away was like knowing the seed spices of your ancestors. And I have Jewish ancestry, which it's like they were, you know, fairly mobile uh, due to <laughs> persecution, right? So it's like they carried mm. certain seeds with them. They ate certain foods. And most cultures have this. My French grandmother on the, my Catholic side um, loved lamb. And I noticed that like caraway seeds from my Jewish grandmother and lamb from my Catholic grandmother, like highly resonant foods in my body, very easy for mm. me to digest, awaken a certain level of it's, it. And it's a subtle attunement in the nervous system where it's like the nerves relax. It's the opposite of that high beta brainwave state. It's more of like the nerves are just like, mm -hmm. <sighs> and that's also the opposite of an allergic state where you're like reacting against the environment. And if we look at like the micro level of that in the endothelial tissue, there's reactive oxygen species that are a sign that they're basically the inflammation generators. They're a sign that like we're in reactive mode. And I think it's a really good thing to think about. Like how much am I in reaction 
versus how much am I actually just in alignment? So when we eat foods that are mm -hmm. deeply in alignment with this ancestral code, it's like, oh yeah, that, that just somehow makes me feel more grounded. So to me, that's important. Oh yeah, this is, yeah, this is all. This is what what he's also basically referring to. It's kind of like, um, it's like like he he says like, oh, our ancestors mainly ate uh, meat and fruits and stuff like uh, berries and stuff. Uh, a little bit of you know seeds here and there, and basically that's. But all, all that bullshit that we eat nowadays with processed food and diet coke, we <laughs> of course not. What? The charts are interesting. When you look at the charts of chronic inflammation, chronic disease, it parallels directly to consumption of sugar, the rise in yeah. consumption of sugar, and the invention and rise of use of vegetable oil. Oh, so yeah. in 1907, right, some German, um, some German lab scientist invents vegetable oil, this hydrogenated process of, of oil. And like that, Those two things parallel. They just everything just goes up together, and it's just a straight. <laughs> it's the hockey stick growth curve, you know. Sugar, sixteen hundred to early nineteen hundreds, not so like it was going up, but still not affordable by the poor people. Early nineteen hundreds production skyrockets. Vegetable oil is invented. Vegetable oil goes mainstream by World War II, and then we're off to the races with chronic disease. And the medical model, again, is based on an early 1900s medical model. It's pre-chronic inflammation medical model. So people who are going to the doctor for allergies, for asthma, for autoimmune issues, for I don't know how many cancers right now they've identified are just tied to chronic inflammation. They're not tied to other reasons. Um, but it's, it's more every day. So we're not actually able to get to yeah. the root of the issue. Oh, yeah. I avoid um, these uh vegetable oils like olive oil i do a little bit uh, and uh, coconut oil but anything else i don't like them so much yeah good that's helping <laughs> that's all helping. so um, and then just resting the digestive tract i mean i think that's the other big thing is just with intermittent fasting and metabolic flexibility it's just like being aware from the last time you eat or have any calories Or any even non, there's these non-nutrient sweeteners that also oh, yeah. for clean fasters go in that category of like none, none of that, no milk in the coffee, no alcoholic beverages. But like the last time you take a calorie or non-nutritive sweetener in until the time that you break the fast, that that should be variable and it should, it should moderate for most adults around a 16-8, so at least a 16-hour fast, which gives you three hours of autophagy three hours of the body being able to process mm. oxidative stress, but pushing, you know, pushing the edge on that. So you can easily go to 20 hours and have a four hour window or do occasionally one meal a day, uh, you know, a day or two a week for a healthy adult. Like that's all really good. And then the flip side of that, it's like, you know, whatever you're with, your friends on the weekend and you open up the feeding window to 14 hours and you have less autophagy that day, but never going less really than at least 14 hours. Uh, and I think the more what we are finding is like the more people are playing that game uh, of, of knowing their feed and fasting time, playing their edge. Some people need to do like 40 hour fasts really regularly. Mm. If their metabolism is pretty stuck, if they've had, if they've been obese for a while and they've lost some weight, then they often need to like fast longer. And then they also need shorter, um, shorter fasting times occasionally too. And that, and I think it all just points to like, we're meant to be flexible and adaptable and resilient. And so whatever mm. habits we have that mix that stuff up are great. It's like the, I'll just say one more thing on this. It's like the, you know, people that are super athletic, I'm pretty darn athletic. And so like this past weekend, I skied up the mountain a few, up and down the mountain a few times and was out for hours and hours and having fun. And then I don't need to exercise as much during the week. I can just go for a walk today and be fine. Because I know in a day or two, I'm going to go out for like three hours and get a lot of cardio and be out in the wilderness and exercise hard. And it's that kind of flexibility that the human physiology and other mammals are designed for. Not just going to the gym for half an hour a day, every day doing the same thing. Okay. So do you attribute that to, to fasting? 
your your, your uh, fitness? Uh, all I'm saying is like, just like we want to be, metabolic flexibility is tied to fasting rhythm, but it's also tied to exercise rhythms. So, the, so okay. it, to me, it's all, it's all part of that. Like we're meant to be able to do hard things like fast longer or exercise longer, go up big mountains. Like we're meant to be able to do that. And we're meant to be able to do the opposite, like being pretty comfortable if you can only get a walk in that day, or if your fasting time's shorter, mm. Because you're being super social, you should be able to easily digest your food without gas and bloating and digestive or elimination issues. So you would recommend to fast every day? To at intermittent least 14, fast every day. So at least 14 hours, but to to stabilize around a median of 16 hours. Yes. Yes. And then most people find that get into the intermittent fasting rhythm that they that fasting for longer feels better. So adapting as you build resilience to, you know, a six hour window of eating, because what happens is you get more focus, you get more concentration, you have less energy going to digestion, absorption, and elimination. You mm -hmm. get more energy going to autophagy and apoptosis, which is where like, I mean, if you just look at cellular, if you look at a cell and you look at the mitochondria, the little energy centers in the cells, like yeah. They fold and they get inefficient over time. And so what autophagy does is it like it kills off the stuff that's inefficient. Yeah. It upcycles those products into the physiology so different components can go to what's needed next. And whenever we short circuit that cycle, we're increasing inflammation. The other thing is fat cells. We should probably talk about fat cells then. Mm -hmm. So fat cells that aren't pulsating. So there's a word, it's a great word in the Vedic system called spanda. And it's the, it's the root of the word um, spandex. Spandex uh -huh. stole the word spanda, which is like, think the of yoga suits. pants. Like you yeah. gain, a lady gains weight, 20 pounds, same yoga pants still fit, right? Pulses mm. out, pulses in. That's the beauty of spandex. So sponda or pulsations is what fat cells are designed to do. So they have to lean out and get super small, and then they're meant to inflate and pick up triglycerides from the blood. And when they do that pulsation, that happy dance, um, they release anti-inflammatory factors. Ah. Uh. And when they don't, when they just stretch out, because there's more and more food particles coming into the bloodstream because people aren't fasting long enough to actually create energy demand from the fat tissue, they release pro-inflammatory factors into the blood. So oh. the fat tissue, the adipose tissue, is now considered an endocrine organ. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and, and, and fat cells also store uh, toxins, right? Yeah, like the EDCs, those nasty endocrine disrupting chemicals that are found in uh, i mean i'll just say everything just to be right they're just every, they're just mm. found in stuff that the chemical industry has produced without being regulated so they're in our they're in mm. our blood so yeah and that's where actually it, the studies on that are kind of crazy with obesity in fasting because there can be such a high edc load in the fat cells that it can just dump a ton of toxicity into the physiology and, and shut organs down. So this is where mm. with obesity, people need, it's, it's best to have that metabolic flexibility where they're not just crash coursing their way through dumping uh, what's in their fat tissue into their bloodstream. And this is also actually one oh, little yeah. hint you were asking about tips before. So this is a, this is a thermos. It has hot water in it and hot mm -hmm. water in Ayurveda, and I haven't read studies on this, um, but it's an it's is like the the beauty of practices that have been done for <laughs> thousands of years by humans, and it's like this seems to work. Is sipping hot water every twenty minutes will gently flush the fat cells if you're in an intermittent fasting mode and keep your tissue super hydrated. So the fat cells have a lot of water weight. So by allowing mm -hmm more gentle hydration, urination, elimination through the sipping the hot water every 20 minutes, like throughout the day, a lot of the, the joint pain, the asthma, the allergies, the skin issues, the digestive issues, they'll start to um, lessen. They but it's lessen a commitment. Because you drink hot water? Thermos. Yeah, sipping hot water every 20 minutes. It's the small quantity, high frequency. 
the, this is so un-American. <laughs> because Americans want cold water and cold water only. <laughs> Oh my God, the ice, right? right? It's well, yeah. and in Ayurveda, like that's the digestion, absorption, elimination part. Like if you're killing it, they, there's the concept of Agni, a digestive fire. There's fire in every cell. There's fire in every cell membrane. This is again Ayurvedic theory. There's fire in every level of tissue. So your plasma tissue, your blood, red blood cell tissue, your muscle tissue. All oh, like this concept of fire and digestion. But the main fire is the digestive fire. And when you sip ice water while having your burger and fries or whatever, you're just killing your ability to digest your food. So if anyone has any of the symptoms we've talked about, like you wake up groggy, you wake up puffy, you wake up and you're dragging, or you have asthma or allergies or itchy skin or, you know, any of these issues, joint pain, et cetera, like just, just stop drinking ice water, start fasting longer, and things should get mm. better. And if you can manage sipping hot water, in the first, usually people hate it in the beginning. But then after like even three, four days, they're like, oh, wait, this is getting better. This is getting better. Then after like three, four weeks, they like it. Mm. Yeah, I never drink cold water. I, I just don't like it. And at, at least I try to get it like in room temperature. Like in every yeah. restaurant I go and every time I'm room temperature, please, room temperature. Yeah, so you can even ask for hot water with lemon. Like that helps, you yeah. know, just like when you walk in, just get in the habit, even if you don't drink it, just kind of mm -hmm. get in the habit, take a few sips and just notice if it feels more deeply hydrating or more quickly hydrating. Mm. Maybe it'll help your allergies. Cool. Cool. Um, thank you. Do you have any other like, like okay, so so let's let, let's uh, summarize, please, uh, what, what, what we can do to be less inflamed like have less inflammation so you you said sleep rhythm um hot water yeah and i have i have an intermittent fasting tip sheet that people can get mm -hmm. and that might help with the basic tips that help people get started and that's oh yeah yogahealer. we could link it here in the in the description we link it? okay yeah it's yogahealer.com forward slash if for intermittent fasting mm -hmm. dash tip sheet um, and I'll also send you, I have a 10 habits of Ayurveda tip sheet and I'll mm -hmm. send you the link to that too. And with these, I've been making these tip sheets, Sven, for 20 years because it was just like, yeah. how do I help this community learn what these guys know over here? And just putting a few tips on a page and some graphic design seemed to, people print them and put them on their refrigerator until they know them, until they're doing, again, you don't have to do them all, all the time. It's not about that. It's not about perfection. It's not about rules. Mm. It's just about getting enough of it in enough of the time that you drop your allostatic load and, and you feel great. So yeah, a, old wives tales are really where it's at. So early to bed, early to rise makes a human healthy, wealthy, and wise. So that's ah, like the basic I, I concept. Know that, yeah, I, I thought it was early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. Oh, I love it. I'm going to share that with my yoga health coaches Oh yeah, because they need that Please. message. They've got their habits dialed in already, but they need, <laughs> they need to advertise and they need to work like that. Awesome. That's cool. Do you think that intermittent fasting thing is also <laughs> good for pregnant women or women that yeah, want to get so pregnant because they seem afraid of it? They're so afraid of it. I know. I know. Well, and we have a, If any, we also have another tip sheet on for women from with Ayurveda, um, yogahealer.com forward slash women, and you'll find that one. When I talked to Mark Matson, who ran a department of the NIH, he mm -hmm. uh, and he wrote a paper. He wrote he he has this massive paper. It's a long one on the the evolutionary perspective. Um, of intermittent fasting in, in the human species. It's called something like that. But if you just put in Matson and evolutionary perspective, it'll come up. And in the interview with him, he was like, you know, 10,000 years ago, human brain size was 10% bigger. And when we got into the pregnant women, he's like, yes, everyone was fasting. Like, as a species, there was food scarcity. It drove brain development. Mm. Moving Yeah. While eating, moving while foraging, moving, 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 moving and burning calories in a fairly relaxed state, like foraging, like that drove human brain development. That drove cognitive function. So with agriculture, our, our, in food reliability, our species is degenerating. 
And we see that, like the studies right now on pregnant women, it's so scary. It's so, so sad. It's so sad, Sven. It, it like really, it makes me go to work every day. Uh, because babies are now born with chronic inflammation because the mothers are overweight. Hmm. So it's hard. I would even say now, like with even clothing sizes, I mean, my mom noticed this years ago. Uh, it's probably not as bad in Europe as it is in the United States, but like sizes started to change. So it's like a size six and a size eight was all of a sudden bigger. So if you like, you would always, my mom was always a size 10 and, and she's a healthy athletic woman. And all of a sudden she was like, now I'm a size eight, like bullshit. Mm -hmm. She didn't change. The size has changed. But that has an impact on fertility. That has an impact on what's happening in utero so that you have insulin resistance in utero. You have fetuses that wow. have become insulin resistant. Yeah, not good, man. And then you start medicating these babies really early. And you think it's overeating? Yeah. It, it's, mm. It's eating too frequently because what happens, and to me, this is the coolest part about intermittent fasting. When you eat less frequently, your stomach size shrinks. Your fat cells shrink. Now you're back in pulsation. You're back in the rhythm of the universe. So overeating is wow. hard to stop if you're eating too frequently. But if you simply mm. eat less frequently, if you have a longer fasting time, Everything starts to return. And all of a sudden, you're like, I don't want as much food. I'm more satisfied more easily. I can't eat as much. It's like the same thing happens to people with gastric bypass surgery. Ah. Right? Because like, they basically get their part of their stomach uh, stapled. And now there's less room. But we can all just do that by extending our fasting time. I think it's a very drastic measure to have that kind of surgery. <laughs> yeah. And it's not I very effective. I can think of it. Yeah, I mean, it's effective yeah. for some people, but a lot of people, it, it, it doesn't see. work for. But fasting really is, people find it, once they get in, and we're, we're developing this whole health club around, we're calling it the health club at Body Thrive, but it's basically like one year, one habit, and we're just helping people with intermittent fasting. It's just that, just mm -hmm. that, because it's so effective. So that's where after 20 years of all the things I've learned, it's just like, that to me is how you make the biggest impact on health. Okay, so also in terms of uh, anti-inflammation, right? Exactly. That's how, that is my, that is my response. That is my response to global chronic inflammation. Is that I see. intermittent fasting. And it takes so, about a year to like really develop the habit for a lifetime. And that's what I'm after is like people with this habit for a lifetime. Aha. Uh -huh. So... And and you would also say like if if a woman can't get pregnant she should do intermittent fasting right? Yeah, I mean I would if a woman can't get pregnant I'd rather like talk to us and have a body goal session which we do for free. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would like to know if they're underweight then no but if they're at all overweight or if we go through those symptoms they wake up and they feel heavy or groggy or joint pain or puffy or negative where their emotions are negative. They're kind of dreading the day ahead. That's also, that's a sign of emotional inflammation. If they have any of that, mm -hmm. yes, let's digest the inflammation before procreation. Please, okay. please, please. You'll have a healthier see. baby. I see, I see. Um, a lot of older men have uh, urine retention problems. I mean, they can really, they cannot a a empty their bladder completely or they have they might have enlarged large prostates um what do you think about that is that also okay is that also like uh, uh them eating too frequently or what's your thoughts it can, about that it, it can be i would say for mo for men with this issue now it's probably more due to sedentary lifestyle so if we look at If you look at the physio the human physiology with polarity, you've got your crown and you've got mm -hmm. your root. And most men right now are, are, they have a lot more energy moving in their head than they do in their pelvis. And you can see it with yeah. their lack of flexibility, right? They can't, like in the yoga, there's this position where you sit on the ground and you put the bottoms of your feet together. Sometimes it's called butterfly pose because your, your knees are out to the yeah. side. And, and, and a lot of men have a lot of issue doing that. And that's one of the best poses for prostate because it's bringing circulation into the groin. Ah. We also see a lot of these men have issues with lower back pain. Yeah. 
And so we put it together. It's like, well, when did it, when, what came first? Was it the urinary issues or is it the lower back pain? So there's just a lot of stagnation in the bowl of the pelvis. So the energy is not fluid like a snake. So in yoga, mm-hmm. many of you guys have heard the words like, um, well, maybe no, this crowd probably has not heard these words, but there's uh, this concept of kundalini, which is a snake-like energy that's wrapped around. This is in the subtle anatomy. It's not in the physical anatomy. So if you think of your body energetically, actually, I heard this really great description of this. You know, when you're hung, if, if anyone's ever been hung over or super sleep deprived, you might feel like there's like a swelling inside and that you can't, you can't function right. Like that's a very depressed subtle body. Whereas if you've just climbed a mountain, you might feel really energized and awake. And that's like mm-hmm. a very expanded subtle body. So that's how we know, we all know that concept. We'd say, well, let's change physiologically. We could look at the allostatic load. The yogis just like to look at the subtle body. So this at the base of the spine is in subtle body analogy and it's, and it's metaphorical, but there's an idea that there's a, there's a serpent that's asleep. And you might think of the mm-hmm. catechus right? The symbol of medicine with the two snakes that go yeah. around the main pole. So the main pole, that's the main energy shoot of the body. It's the main line, the main channel, the main pipeline. That's the Sushumna. And then around that, the, the snake, if, when the energy wakes up at the root of the pelvis, it starts to move. It, move. it can move up and down from the root to the crown. So when you've got prostate issues and lower back pain, and you're a guy who wakes up and has a cup of coffee and takes transportation and sits at a desk and maybe gets a 30 minute walk in and comes home and sits on the couch, eats dinner, lays down, goes to bed. There's not enough circulation happening in the pelvis. That serpent is totally Mm. latent. It's totally asleep. So you're going to have a lot of issues down there. So anything that's like, you know, like it's the movement that is so feminine is what wakes it up. Like, hip openers and hula hooping and like gyrations, Ah. like think John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever, like that kind of movement, that's what that that mobility looks like. And you're just getting blood flow into the back and blood flow into the the glands. Ah, Okay, so you would recommend yoga to those people in this case? Kundalini yoga. I, I mean, anything Probably. like that. Tai Chi, yoga, any anything that's in their realm of, of even functional movement. I'll go for functional movement. Roll around on the ground. That's, to me, functional mm-hmm. movement. Like, functional movement, you start like a baby. You start, like, crawling around. Even crawling is going to bring a lot more openness into the hip joints. There's some, in my new book, Wild Habits, that's not out yet, um, there's a whole section on functional crawling. Because like mm-hmm. the 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 hip movement specialists, like the the fitness and movement specialists, have found all these different ways that humans can crawl and imitate other animals. That can be a lot mm-hmm. more accessible to like a thirty five year old guy with a desk job than going to a yoga class with twenty women in yoga pants and you know. And I get that. Like whatever you whatever's accessible that moves your body in different ways. Let's go with that. Mm-hmm. And then one I more see. thing with prostate and back pain is I'd also really look at hydration. So if you start the day with coffee and you end the day with alcohol, you're not going to have good enough hydration. And then you'll potentially start to have issues with lower back pain and bladder and, and you know all the stuff that's just associated with poor energy flow. Energy flow relies on hydration. Okay, so instead of the coffee and the alcohol, you would recommend, like, drink more water? Yeah, or, like, if you can't change that, and a lot of people, that's hard to change, like, just start doing the sip hot water every 20 minutes. Like, I'm more into, oh, like, yeah. add in before you take out, because it can be hard. It can, And that's mm. also where I've landed with the diet stuff. It's like, don't change your diet. Just change when you're eating. Like, skip a meal. Okay. Save your life, skip a meal. <laughs> Because it's okay. easier. Certain things are easier to do than other things. Like it can be hard for people to really make radical changes. Like, what do you mean I'm not going to have coffee? What do you mean I'm not going to have wine tonight? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very that's very cool. Thank you very much. As kind of a last question, thanks for all your uh, input. That was really inspirational. And I'm going to implement like a lot of it. Uh, you can bet on it. Um, what would your 
like a lot of people have issues with stress and with feeling stressed. And what what would be your best, like, say, three tips or techniques? Uh, maybe you have a sheet also for that, a tip sheet. I know. I, um, I'll, no, I'll make one, though. I'll make one. Because this, we, I taught on this yesterday with my Body Thrive members. And it's we talked about uh, positive stressors versus negative stressors. And there's a lot of great research from behavioral science around doing something that takes less than two minutes. So what we, mm-hmm. what we know about how to change, so ha- stress is interestingly enough, um, we can look at stress as a habit, as a mental habit, uh-huh. where we're actually choosing, we're choosing to worry, we're choosing to think about things in a certain perspective in a certain way that's distressing. So there's distress yeah. and you stress. Positive stressors, negative stressors, or positive stress, negative stress. And so if we, if we look at uh, the emotional inflammation and negative stressors, it's where we feel overwhelmed, not in control of our time, not in control of our reality, depressed, or irritable, pissed off at everybody else. So those are the key ones. So whenever we can use in uh, behavioral science, there's five emotional triggers, or there's, sorry, there's five triggers to creating a new habit. And that's essentially what we need to do is say like, oh, wait. My bad attitude is a habit. So I need to change mm. the habit. So I need a new habit. So then how do I trigger a new habit? And you can use an emotion, a time, a place, another person, or preceding action. Like you might brush your teeth before you wash your face. Or I do this thing with my kid. So that's another person. So what are some little things that you can do that take less than two minutes that will have a shift on your emotional state? Movement is big. Meditation is big. And again, less than two minutes. Uh, there's there's lots. Of, I mean, you can even, we can even just do this for 10 seconds. But if you're sitting, yeah. anyone who's listening, if you're sitting, like stand up. And as you breathe through your nose, like raise your arms over your head. And as you exhale, take your arms by your side. You just do that three times. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, arms down. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, arms down. So super simple three rounds of breath. And all of a sudden you might notice like there's more freaking oxygen in my brain. I'm a little bit happier. So that's all it is, is finding like, when am I, when am I the grumpiest? Right. That's stress. When am I the grumpiest? And then what are little things I can do for that? So one thing that I started doing, because I had a surgery on my tibia bone and I, I need to strengthen it. Is I, when I, I'd fast in the morning, but my kid eats, she's a gymnast, is I do lunges in the kitchen mm-hmm. to strengthen my knee. And I just do, set my timer, two minutes, and I just do <laughs> lunges. It's a little simple exercise yeah. that strengthens my knee. Otherwise, I'm just standing there talking to my kid. But now yeah. I've just inserted something that's moving me towards a positive experience. And it's a positive stressor. Awesome. Yeah. So thank one last you. That, example is amazing. just like putting awareness into your nostrils. This is Anupana meditation. It mm-hmm. comes from a Buddhist tradition where you just choose a focal point and the nostrils is really good. If you can breathe through your nose, if you can't, then use your mouth, but set your timer for 60 seconds and just totally relax and feel your breath. The only thing you have to do in that 60 seconds is feel your breath. That's it. So you, in your nostrils, mm. if you can breathe through your nose, if you can't breathe through your nose and your mouth, if you can't breathe through your nose, start snorting your urine. I got to slip that in there because your whole brain is functioning on breathing through your nose. What happens in that 60 seconds is if you do this a couple times, you know, a week is you'll start to notice that you can relax. Hmm. And now you're shifting brainwave states just in 60 seconds. And you're choosing to say, I'm grumpy, but I'm going to change my mood. Okay. Let Im- imagine every time you're grumpy, you have to snort urine. Then that'll make you happy. <laughs> right? You will feel so miserable right? being grumpy. <laughs> exactly. Well, the yogis believe that it decalcifies the pineal gland. Oh, really? It makes you smarter. Yeah. How Which is a whole topic yogis? for a whole other podcast, Ben. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I read that. You, it, it calcifies because of caffeine and f- f- fluoride. Yeah, fluoride's the the big one. Uh, but actually, uh, obesity calcifies the. There's a direct correlation with obesity and calcification of the pineal gland. 
Mm-hmm. And and snorting urine decalcifies it. How how do you know? Like, well, okay. how did they so come like, over that? Why do I think that works? And we don't have any science on it. I've been looking. I've been trying. Yeah. I'm trying to now work with sciences and labs and get you know, get some data on some things. But there is something to ancient wisdom and user groups over time. I believe mm-hmm. in those things as well as reductionist allopathic studies. Uh, so it, I think it goes something like this. You start, is if this if the urine's aged, you have this negative ORP of like 200, meaning it's like highly reducing oxidative stress. It's It's highly impacting the microbiome to generate nitric oxide. Mm-hmm. Nitric oxide is now being, you know, sold in a ton of medication because it causes a, a dilation effect. So it dilates the ostea, goes into the sinuses. The sinuses now start producing more nitric oxide as well. The urine has nitric oxide, but now the sinuses are producing more of it. Urine also has urea and uric acid. Uric acid is the strongest antioxidant. So from the, from the nose, a lot of medications are snorted now because you go from the nostrils through the sinuses to the olfactory bulbs, from the olfactory bulbs into the cerebrospinal fluid. So if you're trying to affect the central nervous system with a drug, you go through the nose. It's much faster than mm. going through the mouth. The other you know, faster way to get stuff into deeper into the tissue of your body is through your anus. But if you're trying to get something into the central nervous system, you go through the nostrils. Mm-hmm. And you can check out the different medications. I mean, they're using Alzheimer and dementia medications as nasal inhalants now. They're using a lot of hormone, um, even like women's hormone regulation uh, medications through the nostrils. So this is, it's a thing to get stuff into the cerebrospinal fluid. So now you think, okay, now there's some components of whatever's in urine circulating in the cerebrospinal fluid via the olfactory. So olfactory bulbs then have this like this spongy like tissue that then go yeah. in, right the cerebral spinal fluid. So exactly. now let's just say let's just say there's some components of uric acid and urea, two of the main components of urine that are in the cerebral spinal fluid. Well they start to have an antioxidant effect on the calcification. Mm. Especially my guess my guess is it's it's a both Urea, there's a really good study on urea out of Barcelona that shows, because there's not many studies on urine, but there's studies on components of urine. And so with urea, it can penetrate, to, it has this really, it can penetrate deep, deep, deep layers of tissue to blood from skin. So if you put urea on your skin, it penetrates. But they found it actually has an antipathogen effect and an anti-carcinogenic effect. So if... Really? Yeah. So if someone has skin wow. cancer and they start rubbing your, so it has an ability to soften and dissolve and it's through a demulsant agent. Whereas the uric acid, I think that works much more like an acid, right? Where it has more of a, um, if you think of how acids are used to like clean things, it has mm. more of, of that uh, type of a action. But my guess is the, the, the combo is what's going to work on decalcifying the pineal gland. Awesome. Wow, that, that's interesting input. I hadn't expected that. <laughs> I hadn't either. I mean, and that's my, like, that's my theory to date, you know, like to be continued. There's, it's so sad to me. We have, you know, hu- urine is the most, it's the human sub- bodily substance that's most looked at under an, a microscope, but we have the fewest number of studies on it. Like the, there's a project in Canada, the urine metabolome product where they project where they've like isolated all the different metabolic products that are in urine. It's basically everything that's in the body, everything that's in the blood ends up in the urine. But we don't know why the ancients, seemingly in every culture, were using it as medicine. We don't know why. We haven't studied that. I see. Well. Yeah, medicine is fascinating. Like things might help that you wouldn't expect. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, Kate, thank you so much. I enjoyed this very much. If someone wants to reach you or learn more about you or get some uh, t- more tip sheets from you, how can they reach you the best? 
Yeah, I mean, really the best way, email help at yogahealer.com and tell us what you're interested in because we have so many free trainings and free tip sheets. That's really the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you just want to start with the intermittent fasting tip sheet, that's also that's also a fine a fine way to go. And that's uh, yogahealer.com forward slash IF dash tip sheet. All right. Okay, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it and I'm already looking forward to the next time. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sven. Your pleasure to talk to with. Thank you. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode of Svencast again.